welcome to Ariel Elwani's M.M.A. Show! Back in your life on this Monday, January 7, 2017. 2017, 2019. I'm fixing my audio. My audio sucks. Fixing it, my bad. Happy New Year, everyone. I missed you. It's good to be back. Yes, in case you're wondering, why am I sitting here and not that new studio, that brand spanking new studio that you saw last week? Well, I think there's some sort of college football game going on, and it's important, and everything's tied up. And so we're back here, but we're back there next week. And you know, there is something comforting about being back in a place where you sort of called home for several months. So I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to be doing the show. Uh, if you have been living under a rock, a lot of things have happened, including our New Year's Eve show, which aired on television on, e on ESPN2. I hope you enjoyed it. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, if you watched it and saw that studio that we were in, we'll be back in that studio from here on out, except not this week. We're here for this week. At least one more time. You never know what's going to happen, but at least for now, this is the last time that we're here. So sit back, relax, uh, and enjoy the program. We have a lot to discuss. Of course, we haven't done a live show like this since I think it was like December 18th or 19th or even 17th, maybe even 16th, right after that UFC Milwaukee show. So obviously a lot has happened with John Jones and Tyron Woodley and uh, Floyd Mayweather, and we gave out a bunch of awards, and PFL ended their year on a pretty high note, and of course, we're now in the new UFC on ESPN era, and there's so much exciting things. We're on the road to Brooklyn. All those things are happening, and initially, my plan was that we were going to talk about the last two weeks, and I was going to uh, run down my awards, and uh, talk about some honorable mentions that I didn't have a chance to talk about on the air because we were on television. Uh, we were sort of, you know, we were sort of tied to some time constraints and we couldn't really go as long as I wanted to in certain uh, departments. But here on this platform, on this program, we can go a little longer. However, plans changed yesterday uh, because a whole bunch of news occurred and broke. Uh, John Jones, Anthony Smith, but um, perhaps even more interesting was the fact that Tyron Woodley versus Kamara Usman broke. In fact, I broke it, but it came out, it's official, and so a lot of people were wondering what Colby Covington had to say. So uh, we are going to save that talk for the post-show with New York Rick. We'll get to that in a bit, um, and we'll talk about all the stuff that happened at 2.33 and whatnot um, no, 2.32, is it? 2.32? Yeah, 2.33 was the one that was canceled. Anyway, you get the point. We'll run down all the stuff that we missed. For now, though, let me run down today's lineup. By the way, I hope you like my trophy. There it is, the prestigious Helwani Nose Trophy. We'll talk about this. I'll give you my honorable mentions and thoughts on the uh, award winners and whatnot. Uh, okay, this is the lineup. Alex Hernandez, 3.45. He meets Donald Cerrone um, on the Brooklyn card on January 19th. Sean O'Connell is going to join us at 325 he won a million dollars in the pfl finale and then retired pretty incredible the real oc rachel ostovich will join us about competing on that january 19th card and of course everything that has happened in her life over the past two plus months uh kane velasquez is back he meets francis and ganu on february 17th we'll talk to him at 245 in the uh, headliner, of course, of the first ESPN main card. Looking forward to that. Has been a while since we talked to Kane. Katzengano will update us on her eye at 225. Corey Anderson will be in studio at 145. And Joanne Calderwood will stop by at 125. She's also on that Brooklyn card. But first, let us not waste any more time. Let us go to the Skype machine and say hello to our first guest of the day. He joins us right now via the magic of Skype, the one and only Colby Covington. Hello, Colby. How are you? Hello, Ariel. I'm doing good, brother. It's good to see your pretty face again. Well, I appreciate that. And it's nice to see you smiling. I, I didn't know if you'd be smiling this time. Uh, you're still smiling despite the fact that you did not get the nod for the welterweight title. How could I not be sm smiling, Ariel? You know, I'm very thankful for everything I have coming up from the life that I grew up, you know, in a very poor family and 
And, you know, being in a wrestling family, you know, I've been living out my dreams since I was seven years old. I started this journey when I was seven years old. And I made a promise to my parents that I was going to be a world champion. And here I am. I'm a world champion. I, I, I accomplished my goals. And But the thing is, is, it's just the beginning. I'm just getting started on my goals. Okay. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that uh, and see that you're in good spirits. So, so let me ask you, it's the big question that everyone has been talking about for the past 24 hours. Once it became official that Woodley was going to be fighting Kamaru Usman on March 2nd and not you, in the end, why didn't you get the title shot? Uh, you know, in the end, I didn't get the title shot because, you know, politics behind, behind, you know, you wanted to pull the curtain back today. So we're pulling back the curtain, you know, uh, Dana White, he's lied to me, you know, the UFC, they've lied to me. They made promises to me that, you know, I was going to fight Tyrone Woodley in November at Madison Square Garden. They made promises I was going to fight him in January in California. And then all of a sudden I'm getting passed up for a guy behind me that's beating my sloppy seconds. You know, it's not even a guy that the fans want to see, you know, if anything, you know, Dana and, and the UFC, they're on the fans. I mean, you did a poll, 75,000 people voted, 80% of the people wanted me to fight Tyrone Woodley. I mean, there was a bunch of other polls on MMA Junkie. Tyrone Woodley did a poll. I mean, Tyrone Woodley was out there begging for me to fight. I almost feel bad for Tyrone Woodley now. He's like 0 for 6 in fights he's trying to call. So, But we also found out that Tyrone Woodley has no power. So, you know, you know, it's, it's just business for me. Business goes on as usual. I'll just keep getting better here at American Top Team. And there's not a man alive that can beat me, so I'm not really too worried. So why do you think... The UFC and Dana White lied to you. Why do I think what? The UFC and Dana White lied to you, as you just said. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I've done everything they've asked me to do. You know, I've, I've flown over to countries. You know, I went to Australia and sold their show, and they never even paid me to go over there when they promised me they were going to pay me. So they've lied to me before, and I'm sure this won't be the last time they lie to me again. So, you know, I... I don't know why they're lying to me. Why do you think they're lying to me? Do you, would you have any reason why they're lying to me? I don't know. Listen, I, I'm the last person to ask about any of that. But I'm curious about what you just said. They told you that we'll pay you to go out and be sort of, you know, a guest fighter, I think they call it, right? Um, in Australia, that's the infamous card where you and Verdum got into a thing. They said, we'll pay you, and you were expecting to get paid, and you never got paid for that. Yep. They said that they'd pay me as a guest fighter to come out there. I mean, I brought national headlines to their show, Ariel. <laughs> that little beef with me and we're doomed. You know, the national headlines in Australia, all the news was picking up on it. It, it became a very well-sold show because of me, because of my name and what happened there. And they didn't pay me a single dollar. They, they All they did is send me home right away. They sent me on a flight to Australia. It was about a 24-hour flight. And then I had to leave on a day's notice after I sold their show and, and no pay. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, they want to blackball me and they want to act like I'm the bad guy. Oh, so did they not pay you because of that incident? Yeah, they didn't pay me because uh, of that incident. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Um, but, I mean, so much has happened since then. How do we go from going to the White House with Dana White, where it seems like you're the best of friends, to this? I don't get it. Like, once you went to the White House, I thought, all right, this is fait accompli. You are getting that title shot. This is too big of an opportunity to pass up. How do we go from that to where we are today? To be honest, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. You know, I've been willing and ready to fight every time. The only time that I wasn't ready to fight was back in September in Dallas because I had to get a nasal surgery. I went to UFC doctors. I didn't go to my doctors, Ariel. I went to the UFC doctors. And and they were, they were pressuring me. No, you got to fight on six weeks notice. You got to fight Woodley in Dallas, blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden, they, Dana changed his tone once he heard from the UFC doctors that no, He's not. He's he's in no shape to fight. He's in no condition. He has mucus. He's swallowing mucus into his lungs. He can't breathe out of his lungs because there's so much mucus drainage in his nose and his septum's completely uh, like broken. And I had to get the nasal surgery. So, you know, as soon as that happened, he changed his tone. He was like, "Oh yeah, the UFC doctors, uh, you know, are not clearing him. So this is a legit injury." You know, I had to go to USADA. I was calling up Jeff Nowitzki. I'm like, Jeff. Man, I don't want to pop for anything. I'm not John Jones. I don't cheat and do steroids, but you know they're putting me on all these antibiotics. They're putting me on all this different stuff, so I need to get a TUE. And he was like, you know, we were working with USADA hand in hand, and and it's just it's not fair to me. You know, that's the only time. So I think they're trying to hold that against me. But 
But the thing is, is if they were trying to hold that against me, Aaron, why would they offer me the fight with, with Tyron Woodley in the Garden in November? Why would they offer me the fight in January in California for Anaheim, which both I accepted. I accepted with Woodley for both fights. I, I was ready to go. And then now all of a sudden, you know, now they're pulling the fight from me and they're saying I can't fight in March when the, when Woodley's ready to go in March. It makes no sense to me. They're on me. They're on all their fans. They're doling their product. And if they want to give the fans a version of their product and the fans just go along with it and think, oh, it's the UFC product, so, you know, it, it's got to be the best, then, then whatever, then no no big deal. You can water down your business and, and, and continue to shit on your fans. Okay, and have you asked them this question? Have you or your management reached out to them once the news came out or at least once you knew that they were passing you up? Okay, what is going on here and how do we fix this? Yeah, I, I reached out to Dana. You know, I tried to get a meeting with him, a sit-down meeting. He, he does his meetings with everybody else. You know, he, he sat down with other guys and tried to talk this through, and that's all I asked for. I just want to sit down with UFC Brass, with Dana White, the president of the UFC, and just sort this out, you know, figure out what, why they're treating me like this, why everything's happened and turned in this direction so fast, you know. It makes no sense. You know, I can understand if – it was for business reasons and there was bigger numbers and a bigger fight that, that that's why they're doing this. But that's not that way. I'm the biggest fight in the division. Everybody wants to fight me, Ariel. I could sell against anybody in the division, but you know, I don't know that I think they're doing just like you said, you know, they're trying to cut their nose to spite their face. So when you reached out to Dana, uh, did he respond? No, he no sold me. He doesn't wow. want to talk to me, but you know, it's not too hard to find Dana White. So I'm going to get my meeting with him, Ariel. I can promise you that. Okay, what would you say to him? I would ask him, why are you screwing me over? Why are you screwing over the fans? Like, if if this was the NFL and the Patriots won the AFC championship, you think just because Roger Goodell doesn't like Belichick and Tom Brady that he's not going to let them go to the Super Bowl? Mm -hmm. Like, let's be honest. They're going to the Super Bowl regardless. It doesn't matter if you don't like them or you don't like me. You know, I earn my right to fight for a title, and you promised me a title shot. Go back and listen to some videos that Dana White was saying after the Darren Till Woodley fight. You know, oh, Colby's next, 100%. Colby's next. He knew I had a legit surgery and I couldn't fight in Dallas. So, you know, none of this makes sense. And I mean, just as confused as you are, I'm confused. And, and I'm sure that all the fans are confused because this is the fight they want. This is the blockbuster main event at Welterweight, me versus Tyrone Woodley. This has been brewing for such a long time. Since I first trained at ATT and I was beating his ass. And he knows that deep down. He can. He can lie to the media. He can lie to the people. He can't lie to himself. He can't lie to his coaches. They watched me whoop his ass that day. So the theory that I heard was that it all sort of changed around November 30th. That's when Kamaru Usman fought Rafael Dos Anjos. And <clears throat> afterwards, uh, you'll recall Dana White was glowing about his performance. And rightfully so. It was a strong win. And, and, and his insistence coming off an injury to come back on short notice to fight you either in Anaheim, to fight you either in Brooklyn. And your, I guess, response was like, no, I'm going to wait for the title shot, um, is what sort of turned the tables and made them say, you know what? This is the guy that should get the title shot because he wants to fight and Colby's just sitting around waiting for his title shot. Does that sound familiar? Does that seem accurate? No, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound accurate at all. I mean, you got the champion, Tyrone Woodley, who wants to fight six weeks later in March. Why would you do a fight between two top contenders when the champion's ready six weeks later? It makes no sense. I mean, we have to unify the belts. They can say whatever they want. They can't take away this belt. It's the people's championship now. It's America's championship. But this belt needs to get unified. No one beat me for this belt. And there's not a man alive or welterweight on this earth that can beat me for this belt. So, you know, none of those things make sense. In other words, it feels like you and Tyron, in a way, given the fact that your schedules never aligned, are sort of being punished here. And Kamaru, for being a guy who wants to step up and, and for being you know ready and willing and having the long winning streak, is being rewarded. And you have to sit out. Tyron has to fight because he's the champion. And in the end, you're the one who's really losing out. That's the way I view it from the sidelines. Does that seem like an accurate description of what unfolded? Yeah, I mean, it seems accurate, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's not fair, you know? Oh, I'm not, I'm not saying it's fair, by the way. Accurate yeah. and fair are, are, are two different things. I'm just saying that's how I, I am trying to almost rationalize their thinking, um, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, if I'm being honest. I, I, I said it a few times. 
Kamaru is a little bit mad at me if I'm being 100% transparent because he's saying that, you know, I'm campaigning for you. I'm not campaigning for you. I think that when someone gets an interim title shot and wins that belt, all of a sudden you have to unify the titles. I mean, that's just the, that's the whole point of putting in the interim belt, right? Exactly. That's the whole the whole reason, you know. I told uh, the UFC as soon as I walked out of the cage in Chicago, Ariel, after I won this belt, that, hey, I'm getting surgery. The day, the the minute I walked out of the cage, I'm getting surgery. I'm not going to be healthy and ready to fight until November. My body, all I need is four months. All I need is four months. That's it, to get my body healthy, to get my lungs breathing, to get my nose figured out so I can breathe right. I mean, I wasn't even fighting Rafael Dos Anjos at 100%. You know, I've been fighting at a, as a, as a weaker version of myself, but I did it because I knew back then I had to take the risk, the risk to reward equated to itself now the risk reward doesn't make sense you know I, i've already won a belt you know i've already made a good amount of money so you know i don't need to go out there and risk my health to go to go you know do something for the ufc because they're not rational they don't do anything they say oh do us a favor we'll repay the favor who have they ever repaid the favor for they don't do anything for anybody and and i know i can't fight on every card and i know they want me to fight on every card but they need to start going down the line and look at some of the other champions where's max holloway been Where's Rose Nama Junas been? I mean, come on, they, they want to punish me, but what about the other fighters? Like, there's there's 10, 10 other people that are champions or whatever. So why, why don't you go try and get them to book them to fight? And to be clear, you're 100% ready to go for March 2nd. You would have been okay fighting on that card. Oh, yeah, I would have been 100% ready. I, I was 100% ready for Anaheim January uh, 20, whatever it, yeah. whatever it was, you know, yeah. until they canceled the show. Right. So, you know, I, I've been 100% ready since the new year. You know, I was I was ready for the Garden in November. I was going to fight Woodley, and then they even offered me Nick Diaz. And I'm like, you know what? I, I don't I mean, it doesn't make sense for me to fight him. He's an easy fight. But if this is going to save your show, you know, I'm willing to fight him for you guys to make you guys money. Hmm. Uh, it's a fascinating thing because, and I, I know I'm not breaking news to you, you are not the most well-liked fighter in the UFC. People love to boo you. Yet in a weird way, I feel like they've just turned you into a baby face. They've turned you into a sympathetic baby face. Like now I look at all the comments and people feel bad for you. In a million years did I ever expect to read people actually feeling bad for you, feeling that you have been wrong. But I think that's what happened here. How do you feel about that? And have you noticed the same phenomenon? Uh, you know, I haven't noticed it yet, but, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, people can relate to my situation. You know, I've worked hard for something. I've earned something. You know, I put in the time. You know, I've been I've been grinding since I was seven years old, Ariel. This is a lifetime of work, you know. So for someone to take something away from me that I earned, it's not fair. And, and, and you know, from a guy to Dana White who's going out there trying to bury my name saying, oh, nothing's guaranteed in life. Uh, Dana, you let's talk, buddy. There's a lot of things guaranteed. Death and taxes are guaranteed. Your golden parachute's guaranteed, Dana. Your paycheck's gonna clear this week with the UFC, Dana. So there's a lot of guarantees in life, Dana. Yeah. Um. So right now, like, has this has this taken away your love of the sport? Like, how do you feel? This this you you mentioned politics. It feels like, and and it's somewhat ironic for someone who's talked about politics a lot over the past year. You're now a victim of politics. Has this has this ruined your love for the sport? Not at all, Ariel. It's only made me more passionate. Things like this, you know, I, I've always loved things like these, these trying times, these 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 downs in the road, you know, it just it makes the, the ups that much sweeter. And, and it, you know, it just it's just back to the drawing board for me. I'm just, you know, I'm not sitting around just, you know, partying with chicks all the time. You know, I'm in the training room and American top team improving, getting better. So this is only driving me, my love for the sport to, to go to new heights. Uh, you know, I'm going to be that that person that they wish they would have gave that title for it, fight. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the biggest draw there ever was in, this, in in fighting. I'm not just saying the UFC. If I'm somewhere else, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't need to be in the UFC. I don't need the UFC. The UFC needs me. How would the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, what would he think if he found out that you didn't get a title shot? After all that, the photo op, the belt on his desk. I mean, have you given him a call? Have you have you asked for his two cents? I haven't I haven't given him a call yet, but I know that he would be pissed. He <laughs> you know, he doesn't like lying to the people. You don't lie to the people and and also, you know, his biggest slogan, his biggest phrase is phrase is promises made, promises kept. Right. You know, Dana White promised me title shot after title shot after title shot, and here we are today. I have no title shot. 
They're passing up for a guy that just beat my sloppy seconds. A guy that hasn't even beat a guy in the top 10 coming off a win. He beat two guys that are shell of their former selves because I retired those guys. Because I left those guys in pool of blood. So, you know, is it, it doesn't make sense. And, and I, I'm pretty sure, you know, Mr. Don would, would agree with me. I heard that they want to do you versus Darren Till in London on March 16th. Is that accurate? No, not accurate. No, they haven't talked to you about that? No. Uh, you know, I unless they're calling me with a title shot, I ain't got nothing to say to them. You know, the they you know if you know I don't I don't need them. They want to release me, release me. You know, I, I, it's not a big deal to me. Okay, so you're gonna wait for the winner. That's your plan. Yeah, that's the that's the plan, man. That's what I earned. You know, let's be honest. Both these scrubs that are fighting in this title fight, they both want to fight me. They can agree on that. They know I'm the bigger fight in the division. So, I, I sell with anybody in the welterweight division. I'm the marquee. I'm the docket. Everybody wants to see me fight Ariel. So. You know, I'm going to wait to get what I deserve and what I earn. You know, I'm not taking anything less. I'm not fighting guys coming off losses. I'm not fighting anything less than what I deserve. And that's a title fight. You know, I already got a title. So, you know, it's not a big deal. If they want to hold out on me, you know, no big deal. I'll find something else to do. I've already created my brand and who I am. You know, I can go do anything, Ariel. I go to WWE. I can go, you know, to Hollywood. I go start doing cameos and stuff like Tyrone Woodley. I can go start talking about the Kardashians on TMZ. You know, I'll start doing that. Shit. Talk, start talking about what all these A-list celebrities are wearing each day. Uh, are you going to go to UFC 235? Nah, it's a waste of my time, dude. It's a joke. Those guys, it's going to be a boring fight. You know, it's just, no one wants to see that, dude. Like, it's a joke. I mean, everybody knows. Look at the fans, man. I mean, you did your poll. Everybody did the polls. No one wants to see that fight. Everybody wants to see me fight. So whether to win or lose, it's all the same thing. People were tuning in to see me fight. So, you know, I, I don't got any interest in going to see that fight. It's a joke. It's it's two jobbers fighting for a belt. It's an imaginary belt. So it's a paper title. Do you have a rooting interest? In other words, do you hope Tyron wins so you can finally settle the score? Or do you hope, you know, Usman wins so that you can settle the score with him? Because you kind of have two things going on here. It's good to have options. Yeah, it's good to have options, but you know, I gotta I gotta settle the score with I you know, I got unfinished business with Woodley. Man, yeah. we've this has been brewing for so long, Ariel, since the first day we chained at ATT. He's known who his alpha is. He knows who his daddy is. So, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna be happy until I finish that. But you know, there there's there's other big fights out there. You know, there's a guy from Canada who beat the shit out of him, you know, that's in another organization. And you know, he, he has a claim to be the number one guy in the world right now. So the oh. number one welterweight. So you know, the options are plenty for me. You know, I, I have decisions and choices to make. And if they want to start threatening me that, oh, you don't take fights, that, that doesn't go here, let me go then, man. If, if I'm not a, you know, if you don't see the value of me. Hey, Ariel, they were trying to cut me after the Damian Maya fight. That's how stupid the UFC is. They wanted to cut me after the Damian Maya fight. They said, no matter what happens in the fight, we're cutting you. Why? What happened? We're here today. I got a <laughs> title. I fought RDA. Why did they want to cut you? Because they, they said that that I, I wasn't a draw and I wasn't entertaining and 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 they had no use for me. That, mm. that was their quote unquote. Wow. So you're saying, hey, let me go. I'll go to Bellator and fight Rory McDonald. That's essentially what you just said, right? I'm essentially saying I'll go fight anywhere. I don't I don't need I'll go fight. I'll go fight, you know, with a mop. I could build a fight with a mop. It doesn't matter who I fight. You know, everybody would be more interested in me fighting a mop than they will with anything Tyquil Woodley does. Right. So, you know, I'm just saying, just let, let me, let me, let me fight. Let me do what I want to do, but don't try and control me, you know, cause you're not going to control me. I'm not the guy that you say jump and I say how high I'm not that guy. Tyrone Woodley, he's your guy. Is this fixable? The relationship between you and the UFC or have they done irreparable harm in your opinion? There's no friends in business. This, yeah. this is business now. So, you know, I'm not, I never came here to be Dana White's friend. I didn't come here to be friends with anybody in the UFC. I came here to do business. Money speaks and money talks. So until I see some, some big numbers around my paycheck, then I don't got nothing to say to them. But, you know, this should be a lesson to a lot of the other fighters, Ariel. Whether all these fighters are laughing at me at home and like, oh, ha, ha, Colby got screwed. Oh, I'm so happy. Dude, I went to the White House. I did something that you guys will never, ever do and something that's never been done before in the sport. I have a belt. Dana White put a belt around my waist. If you think in your position, like, you're better or you're going to change something, no. Look at what they're doing to me now. You don't think they're going to do the same to you guys in the future? Like, 
You guys got to stand up for yourselves. Otherwise, you're just going to get used and abused and thrown to the back of the line and, and out to, the, you know, to nowhere land. Do, do you regret any decision that you made? Like in hindsight, do you feel like you could have done things differently? Nope. I don't regret any decisions, Ariel. I've, I, you know, I, I've showed up for the UFC every time they needed me to show up. Never turned down one fight. Never hit no pregnant ladies when I was driving and then hit and run. Never failed a steroid test. Never missed weight. Complete professional on fight week. Always did everything. Always on time. I don't regret one thing. I'm the ultimate company man. And let's just say this fight happens in March. Very good chance, you know, the winner doesn't return in a month or so. Uh, that will mean you will be out for at least a year since your last fight. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I'm very comfortable with that. I'm 30 years young, Ariel. I just, I'm just, i just getting started. I haven't even reached my full potential. You see in every fight that I fight, I continue to get better every single fight. So, you know, however long it takes, it doesn't matter. Time's on my side. Ty time's not on Tyrone Woodley's side. We got unfinished business. We need to settle this, but time's not on his side. Father Time's catching up to him quick. So time's on my side. However long it takes to make this right, I'm willing to wait. And it's, it's only going to be worse for these guys. There's not a man alive that can beat me right now in the world. As time goes by, it's only going to get worse. Any final message for the UFC? Thank you, UFC. Colby, I appreciate this. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. I'm sorry it happened this way. Um, but good luck with how it all plays out. Don't feel sorry for me, Earl. Feel sorry for all the people, all the fans. That's all, that's all the people that got, you got to feel sorry for. All right. There he is, Colby Covington. Uh, as you can see, still with his interim title. Upset that he is not getting a title shot at UFC 235, March 2nd in Las Vegas. In the end, it goes to Kamaru Usman. Kamaru Usman versus Tyron Woodley. By the way, uh, interesting to note, uh, you don't see the Trump paraphernalia there in that interview. Um, I thought that was interesting to observe.